Starting out, number 10, is the over-reliance on drip irrigation. Now, I know drip irrigation is on the topic today, and I'm not dissing drip irrigation. Drip irrigation is a great tool, but the problem is in a lot of landscapes, we see it utilized incorrectly. And the problem with drip irrigation is when do you know your drip system stops working? When everything dies. <laughs> it's not like the sprinkler. A sprinkler pops up, you either see it working or not. You know, I'm, imagine you're not going out there digging in the dirt. You know, is there a drip of water coming out of that tube or not? Um, and so drip irrigation takes a lot of maintenance and management. Um, so the key to having a good drip irrigation system is to make sure it was properly designed, proper flows, proper pressures, proper spacing of that product. Um, there's lots of different drip products in the market, drip tape, drip tubing, uh, inserted dripping emitters, point source devices, um, and not all of them are, each one of them has its best place for being utilized in the landscape. So we want to make sure we choose the appropriate drip product when we apply that in the landscape. We want to make sure it's properly installed. Uh, if it's not properly installed, we can get poor uniformity, poor performance, and our plants could suffer as a result. And then poor maintenance. And so not a lot of, where we sort of see a lot of our problems in the landscape is that drip systems are just poorly maintained. It's because you don't see them really, especially when they're buried underneath mulch or if they're in turf grass applications, you don't see them running. And then when we know we have a problem is when you say that plant dies. And so I um, can't point to the pictures on that side, but I want to try to point them out here. Uh, just some really good examples here. I was teaching a class in El Paso here. Um, this one on the far right. And that's at the El Paso Water Conservation Center where that drip system just <laughs> leaks everywhere. You know, great concept, but just not poorly, poorly maintained. Uh, the picture in the middle uh, is actually from a hotel that I stay at frequently when I travel to San Antonio for work. And I saw this right there at the front entrance of the hotel for about six months. I traveled to that hotel three or four times over a six month period and it never changed. And so I don't know if they were trying to grow concrete with that drip or what, but you can see it just wasn't being very well maintained. And you can see the result of that landscape. It's pretty poor looking right now. Um, and then on the far right is a picture from our uh, turf grass research plot we have on campus where we have about almost one and a half acres of drip for turf grass installed. And so we're looking at different products, spacings, flow rates, et cetera. And so we can see here, here was the one extreme end of that plot where you just get streaking in the field, which we expected that for that design, but we're able to prove, you know, this product with this spacing does not give you the uniform that you really need. So drip is good. We just need to make sure that it's properly designed, installed, and maintained, and we have a very we can utilize it very efficiently. Uh, but just saying I'm going to put drip out, it's going to save so much water. It takes continuous maintenance and management to maximize our efficiency with that product. Uh, irrigation of hardscapes, you see this everywhere. Uh, water on the concrete, water going down the road, um, the, gut, or the, the road drains, all that, lots of places. And it's generally a fairly easy problem to, to fix, especially when it comes to sprinklers. We go to our sprinkler, we just adjust that sprinkler correctly to where it throws that water into the landscape. It doesn't throw that water onto the sidewalk or into the road where it's going to be wasted going downstream. We want to keep that water in the landscape, get it into the soil where that plant can take up that water through the root system. Uh, following up on my number 10 comment, um, I have this uh, big picture here on the left, and uh, college station is a college town, obviously, and uh, when you have a truck in a college town, people ask you to help them move a lot. Um, so I was helping a friend move, there's my truck, and this brand new apartment complex, it's just our condo, Probably more of an apartment, I guess I'll call it. One of the first people to move in there, we were helping them move in one evening after work, and I see all this water coming out of this bed, or this landscape area, and I'm thinking, I'm like, man, that's a lot of water, but I don't see any sprinklers running, so I kept moving, kept moving stuff, and at the end of the, the move, I walked over and I looked at it, and it was all freshly done sod and landscape, and I looked at it and picked up a piece of sod, and there was drip irrigation underneath there. And that irrigation had been running for over two hours, um, and you can just see what's happening there, you know, it's drip irrigation, you're being efficient, right? Well, it's not being applied correctly here. Uh, a great technology, but they just overran that system. You see, it just overfilled that bed and uh, lots of water running off there onto the parking lot. Our broken sprinkler heads. 
Okay. Uh, picture on the right. These are all most of the pictures are all from my personal collection, and I'm really bad about stopping and taking pictures in awkward situations. Uh, whenever I see something, I'm like, that's a good presentation slide there. Um, so pick the big picture here. I had to go to Walmart late one night to get some stuff. It was like 9 30, 10 o'clock at night, and there you see in the parking lot, a geyser from Springfield. Well, the problem is, you know, anybody that probably has any real control of anything like that at Walmart, the managers are probably at home. Or they're stuck inside the business, you know, they're worried about the inside stuff. They probably really don't care about the landscape. So the part people that are pushing the carts back inside, they probably don't pay any attention to it and don't tell their managers, hey, there's a broken sprinkler out there. But this could happen to any of us. Because when does your irrigation system run at your house? At night, when you're most time not outside, right? And so these are very easy things to fix. Go get you a new sprinkler head, unscrew the old one, screw the new one in. But we have to see it. And when our systems run at night, we can't identify that. So it's good to have some type of plan to go through, at least I say seasonally. Um, maybe once a month during the summer when you know you're getting a lot, and just turn it on every zone. Make, it, make sure it all pops up and runs correctly. But broken sprinkler heads, we've uh, done this in the lab, you know, one broken sprinkler head can lose about 10 gallons per minute. And so you imagine, you know, how many nights a week, how many days per month that sprinkler is broken before someone finally gets to gets someone's attention and they correct it. So uh, lots of potential for water conservation by just fixing those broken heads but after we have first identified that we have broken heads. Runoff, uh, runoff kind of follows up with those as well. We talked about irrigation of the hardscape, so broken sprinklers. But when we focus on runoff, typically we're looking at problems where we're applying too much water at one time. You may be focusing it in the right area, the system may be designed well, but it may just be a scheduling issue. And we're applying the water too fast for what the soil can take it in. And so you can see here is a picture, it's actually a picture on campus on the left. Um, you can see it's a very difficult area to irrigate with sprinklers, a median area there. Um, got spray heads and that water just going everywhere. Uh, the picture on the right, if you can't tell by the building in the background, is that a water burger. Um, one day at lunch, I'm looking there and you see these sprinklers here, four spray heads popping up, irrigating a tree that's heavily mulched. Well, most of that water is going to run off of that mulch there and go, like you see, it's kind of, kind of difficult to see, but you can see the parking lot is wet. Um, to me, this would have been textbook drip design. I don't know why the designer or the installer or whoever installed the system uh, went with spray heads, but that's not the best technology for that application. Um, they're applying that water way too fast to a small area. You can't, in the majority of that water is going to be running off into that parking lot, not getting into the root zone where it can be efficiently used. And number six, our mixing of our irrigation zones. This is probably what I'm starting to see more common happening these, these days is because uh, people look at the plants more for their aesthetic value than their water requirements. And so we mix plants of different water requirements, it makes it a real challenge for us to schedule that irrigation system effectively. Um, and so, you know, I see a lot of times we're on the same valve, the same sprinkler, same zone, we're irrigating maybe turf grass and shrubs or flowers and shrubs at the same time. The problem is those different plants have different water requirements. And so one may require much more, they may be similar, but there are different water requirements out there. And so when we schedule that irrigation system, we're going to have to pick, okay, what plant do we want to survive the most? And if we, whatever plant we pick, the other ones are going to get too much water or not enough water. And this is actually in the state rules. All systems after 2009, TC, we says, have to be hydro zone, where you group your plants based on common water requirements and you irrigate them with a common sprinkler device based on that common water requirement. And so here's a picture. Um, I'll just say this is at a park in Houston um, that I was teaching a class at. Um, a city park, and it's a, it's a very nice park. And you can see we turned on the zone and all these sprinklers turn on. And you can see here what we have happening is we have turf grass, then we have some type of a ground cover, small shrub, then we have some ferns, and then we have more turf grass again. So that's three different turf type plant, if we ignore the trees in the zone, that's three different plant types there that are irrigated off of one runtime. So if you were scheduling this, the, uh, creating a schedule for this uh, setting on your controller, what plant would you base your schedule on? The 
one you like the most. <laughs> if it was me, I'd focus on the turf grass. And so if I irrigate maize with turf grass requirements, what's that going to do with other plant materials? Granted, they all look okay here. Um, I don't remember the results this audit here exactly, but it makes it very difficult to manage three different plant types like that. We can see this commonly mixed across homes, people uh, in their beds on the sides of their homes using one sprinkler to throw over a bigger area. And um, it makes it just a challenge to make the water requirements correct what they should be on their controller. Number five, kind of getting to where we're going to talk about some technology here in a little bit, so I'll just briefly touch on rain sensors, but we see a lot of sites where we have a missing, misplaced, or even a broken rain sensor on the irrigation system. Now, state rules say that with all automatically controlled systems that are installed after 2009 have to have a rain sensor. Um, your city regulations may go much further beyond that. But if you have an automatically controlled system, you should make sure you have a rain sensor installed. And it's good to check those uh, sensors regularly to make sure they are working correctly. Because we do have wireless sensors, we have wired sensors. And so things can happen with the batteries going down on the wireless or they're being damaged to the wires because of squirrels or birds uh, crawling inside of the house, something like that. Um, here's two pictures, and I actually got both of these pictures of these rain sensors here from manufactured websites. Um, and I have some, uh, some concerns about these pictures here. And so if we look at, is that sensor properly installed? Uh, look at this picture on the right. Um, it looks like it's installed correctly. It's mounted on the gutter, um, clear in the open. But when I look at that picture, I can see, well, there's a couple of things that point that look uh, come to my attention. Uh, one, or the major one, is that we can see that there's some type of plant material growing in the gutter right you see some type of vine there and so while it looks good in this picture now how long is it going to take that vine to grow over that sensor and cover it up to where rain doesn't hit it anymore so that's a concern i have uh, additionally you know we see here it's a very nice look at clay tile roof um, and to me it looks like if we get a big rainfall event that water just will slide off that roof and just drown that sensor uh, now that sensor is a little electronic device it's made to get wet but it's not made to go underwater so, uh, you know, just a, a couple of concerns there. Um, pr primarily my concern is the vegetation area that could, could grow over that and damage the or cover the sensor. The other picture here we can see is, uh, it looks like this spot here. Um, again, man, on the gutter, but it's maybe difficult for y'all to see, but it looks like the sensor is shaded. Uh, we can see the back of the house, uh, or the other side of the roof of the house here has lots of sun, and then that is shaded. And anytime I see a sensor that's shaded, well, that's making, making me think, well, is there a tree that's gonna block the rainfall from that sensor? Uh, or at the same time, we, these sensors get wet and then they have to dry out based on the climate conditions. So is that gonna affect how fast or how slow that sensor dries out being shaded versus in the open? So just a couple of concerns to think about when you look at rain sensors. And we'll be talking more about rain sensors uh, as we talk about more technology a little bit later. Number four, pressure regulation. Um, we're starting to see it become more common where we have too much pressure for our irrigation systems. And the reason we see we have a lot of pressure because we're seeing cities continuously growing. New water treatment facilities, new water towers, pumping stations going in. That city or that utility has the responsibility to deliver that water to you as a customer at your home. Well, how do they deliver that water? Pressure is what pushes that water to your house. And so they want to make sure there's enough water to go from the pump station or the water tower all the way to the very end of that service area. So depending on where you are located in that utility network, if you're really close to that water tower or that pumping station, you're going to have a lot more pressure being delivered to you than the homeowner that's at the very back of the subdivision at the very end of the city, who's at the very end tail end. Uh, so, uh, when we don't have the correct pressure on our sprinkler devices, we get misting. Pretty obvious picture here. We see misting the very fine water droplets coming out of that system. And when we get those very fine water droplets, what's going to happen is either there's a wind or the sun's going to, the wind's going to blow that droplet away or the sun's going to evaporate before it has a chance to actually hit the landscape and make its way into the soil where it can make its way to the root zone to be, to be extracted. 
So making sure we have the proper pressure for our irrigation system can increase our performance of our landscape by making sure we're getting adequate coverage. Uh, if we have too much missing occurring, we end up with dry spots where we may have to irrigate longer to get our target amount of irrigation applied. And so uh, basic uh, analysis and research has shown that anywhere from 30 to 50 percent of that water can be lost when you have high pressure. And so it's pretty easy to check, you know, call your licensed irrigator, go get you a little pressure pitot tube at the, at the hardware store, and you then check how much pressure does your sprinkler have, and then look up your manufacturer's guidelines online and say, okay, well, I have a spray head. Typically, spray heads are operated at 30 psi. Typically, a rotor, anywhere from 45 to 55 psi for residential landscapes. And you can see, do I have too much pressure? Do I need to put a pressure regulator on my system, some type of flow control? Um, you know, how do I address those problems? Um, I have a really good picture here. This is at a subdivision entrance uh, near my house in Bryan, Texas. Uh, driving by one day on the way home from work, and you just see this cloud of water. And so you can see, obviously, you know, lots of places where that water just kind of almost going up into the atmosphere. And, uh, not a lot of that water is going to be, or not as much of that water is going to make its way into the soil where it can be used by that plant. So we want to make sure we had it operate correctly where we can actually see the distribution of that water being applied as fine streams out of that device. And then number three is kind of tying everything back together here. Just our regular lack of, our regular inspection and maintenance we need for our irrigation systems. Going through and just doing that annual checkup, seasonal checkup at, at a minimum. Uh, does all your sprinklers pop up? Do you have any damaged sprinkler heads? Are there uh, holes in the pipelines? Um, is your valve opening and closing correctly? Uh, we want to make sure everything works right. You see, you just pretty obvious things we can look at here and say something is wrong with these sprinkler heads. Uh, doing your regular maintenance. Uh, one thing I'm sure that many of you don't check on, but how many of you have an automatic irrigation system? When was the last time you changed the battery on your controller? Okay, let me rephrase. How many knew your controller had a battery? <laughs> Okay, so I'm guessing probably since day one, the system controller was installed, it's probably that original battery. And just, you know, your typical little square uh, battery that, you, that it goes in that system. And most controllers, you know, are good that if you lose power at a site, the memory is magnetically stored on that controller. So, you know, what day and how long it runs, that is stored. But the problem is when you lose power, your, your controller clock and your day of the week can go away. So if you lose power, which we know we're known to have storms, right? Tornadoes, hurricanes, whatever, where we can lose power for a day or two at a time, maybe, in uh, severe cases, and that system turns back on, we don't want it turning back on and saying, okay, it's midnight now when it's actually four in the afternoon. Um, so it can throw off your scheduling, especially if your city has restrictions or ordinances about what time of day you're allowed to irrigate or which days of the week you can irrigate, that can get you in trouble for irrigating at the wrong time, and you didn't even know because your controller lost power and then came back on at a different time and date. So check that check that controller battery and uh, make sure it's still good, or just go ahead and replace it. It's a simple thing to uh, prevent problems in the future. Um, checking your sprinkler head, we talked about that, clogged nozzles here. Um, I like this picture here on the left. I took that at a sports field in Dallas where we were testing. And we turned on the system and the head popped up and nothing came out. Okay, so checked it off. Clog nozzle has been repaired. Uh, went down, kept checking the rest of the irrigation system, came back by, and that head was still sticking up. And so that head is, did not seep back down. So what's going to happen if you're not paying attention now? Wow. Lawnmower's going to just come flying by and knock it off. Instead of having a clog nozzle that's not irrigating at all, you're going to have that broken head being a geyser now, wasting water. So just check those heads, make sure they pop up, work correctly, throw the water where they're supposed to, and then seep back down into their sprinkler bodies. Improper controller programming. And so um, while your system may be uh, operating good, you know, all your equipment in good condition, um, how does your schedule look? Are you irrigating the proper amount, the proper duration, the proper frequency for your landscape? So a lot of factors go into creating a good schedule. Um, changing our water requirements seasonally. We know our plants require most of their water in the summertime, but we don't need to irrigate at a July rate in 
February, do we? So we can change that schedule, turn a year off in the winter or decrease it to a very minimal amount in the winter, build it up in the spring, let it peak in the summer and then decrease into the fall and then either turn it off or put the minimal amount out in the winter depending on what kind of winter we have. Um, does your controller have the same runtime for all the zones? Well, in my eight years of doing irrigation audits, I've never tested an irrigation system where every zone has the exact same application rate. I mean, it's not guaranteeing that every zone has the same water requirements. So that controller, you need to make sure that controller is fine-tuned to each zone's requirements. The specific runtime for this sprinkler for this plant material. Customize that controller. And then we also need to take into account all the other changes in our landscape. Uh, we maybe don't have too much issue with slopes here in this part of the state. Maybe we have to adjust our schedule because part of our yard is sunnier, uh, part of our yard is shaded. So that means one site requires more water than the other. Um, and then mention, like I said, to mention the basic differences in plant water requirements and how our sprinklers apply that water. Taking all those factors into consideration. Uh, but a problem I see, I haven't done a whole lot of analysis in this part of the state, but from what I do in the Dallas area with the cities, we go out and we look at controllers and see how homeowners are doing in their scheduling practices. And we see that for the most part, lots of homeowners are over irrigating. And they may not, it's not necessarily on purpose either. It's just that the homeowner maybe doesn't know how to, uh, how to program their controller correctly. Um, how many of you know what a program is on your controller? How many of you know what a start time is on your controller? How many start times does your controller have per program? Mm -hmm. So if you look at it just in a general sense, most residential controllers have three programs, at least an A, B, and a C program. And for those A, B, and a C programs, you can have up to four run, four run times per day, maybe even five, that you can program. And if you're not paying attention to what program you are, you're using the up arrow, right arrow, you know, plus, minus, all these buttons on your controller, you can turn on all these extra stations. And so if you have three programs and four start times per program, and you don't know how to program that controller correctly, you can essentially turn that system on 12 times in one day every day. That the controller has that capability, and we've seen that in some cases because a homeowner was adjusting their schedule like we told them to, but they didn't realize they were on, their turf grass was on program A, but their controller was set to program C, and they were turning on program C five times a day, but didn't realize that program A was already running five times a day. Um, so make sure you're aware of you know how many program times, start times you have, um, and program it correctly. You know, contact a licensed irrigator. Or make sure you understand the manual. Uh, someone like that can help you. And then the biggest problem we see with irrigation systems is just poor design. Lots of design flaws out there. Um, irrig uh, irrigators, non-irrigators, whoever installed the system, they may have been in a hurry or it may have been. A, Homeowner wanted the cheapest system. They told them, you know, a lot of people say, you're going to say, well, I wanted to do this, but the homeowner said that was too expensive, so I had to do this. Um, well, quality costs money. So we got to tap. If we want a good design, we got to pay for it. Um, this probably isn't the best picture for this audience, uh, commercial landscape, but here's a, a residence here that we were looking at in, uh, again, in the Dallas area. I do a lot of work up there. We visit this home, we're doing the irrigation class, and the homeowner was very proud of this landscape. It was a home he'd bought in over the last few years, and he'd redone the entire landscape. And he took us around, showed us where he built all these beds, and you can see where he put in these sidewalks, and it's a, from the street, you know, it looks very nice. Um, but then he went to turn on the irrigation controller, and it turns out he never changed the irrigation system. And so, to so this is kind of difficult to see if you're the lighting, but we can see here we have a rotor head popping up, throwing water here, and then there's another rotor right here on the edge. And, um, essentially, this is all turf grass before, and he left the same turf grass irrigation sprinkler layout he had before. So, we're kind of getting back to a couple of those questions we had earlier, where you can see we have how many different plant materials we have turf grass, we have this material, so one, two, three, four maybe five or six different plant materials all being irrigated from one zone. So there was no irrigation design that's necessary at this point anymore. A lot of effort and time went into design this landscape, but zero effort went into redesigning the irrigation system to meet that specific landscape's needs uh, for water management. 
And uh, here's just a good picture I like to show that, you know, if you have a poorly designed system where it's not designed based on the proper flows and the proper pressures, you get what I call irrigation donuts. <laughs> and you can see uh, the irrigation aliens or the irrigation donuts came by, and you can see you all these little green circles here in the landscape. And this is a product of either having your sprinkler head space too far apart or not enough pressure and flow to where you get the head-to-head -head coverage. And head-to-head -head coverage is very important in irrigation design. When one sprinkler head pops up, the very last water drop should hit the next sprinkler. And then that head should pop up, and that, that head's very last water drop should hit the following sprinkler. All those sprinklers should be touching. It shouldn't be the last drop hits the last drop. They should be overlapping always. And if we don't get that head-to-head -head coverage, we get poor uniformity, and we end up with these little dry rings from not getting that full coverage. And then here's a, a, my final reddish design right here. Um, my colleague with the utility in San Antonio uh, sent me this when they were out doing a customer complaint about a high water bill. And so, <laughs> and that's, that's why he's in the conservation department. It's the first thing they do is show up and they look at the irrigation system and say, okay, well, let's see, look at your irrigation before we start looking at, you know, do you have leaks or whatever? And um, I don't know what this is exactly. I like to think maybe it's a mailbox. Uh, um, I don't know, but it has a sprinkler in it irrigating an area maybe six square feet, not even six square feet, and where's all that water going? Everywhere but probably those three plants in that planter. <laughs> um, and it make it worse, you fall it down here, you just kind of get a little bit difficult to see, but we have a sprinkler on the bottom here too, irrigating the shrubs. And that's probably about 12 or 18 inches wide, that area between those uh, bricks or concrete tiles, wherever those are. Um, water's going everywhere but to the plant. Textbook drip design. This is what you should use drip irrigation for, not sprinklers. Um, I don't know why they did this, but it's just a poorly designed system. Um, so we should avoid these situations, make sure you have a good quality that applies water only where it's needed. Our goal with the irrigation is to get that water into the soil where the plant can pull it up through its root zone. Okay? So, top 10 list there. Um, and a lot of this, you know, can just be a tie to just look at your system and do a general review of it uh, seasonally. Okay, right now is the time where our water requirements start to get dry again, um, getting warm again. Uh, plants are starting to need that water. And so just taking that 20, 30 minutes, turning on each zone, and letting it run for a few minutes. Let it come to pressure. Don't just turn it on for a minute and then let it turn go to the next one. Let it run for three or four, maybe five minutes, and see, okay, what happens? It or Maybe do a full cycle. Is your controller program to run 15 minutes, three days a week? Um, what happens if it runs that 15 minutes? Is that 15 minutes more water than that landscape can absorb? Should you maybe divide that 15 minutes into two eight-minute cycles so that you'll get that runoff down the street? Just watch it operate. And you can learn a lot about that system and how it operates or how it should be operating. Okay, so now we can move on to the technologies. They know about how our operation and management system should be. What tools do we have available to help us manage that irrigation system? And so I'm going to take some time here and focus on smart controllers. Um, how many of you have a smart controller? Okay, a few of you do. And so uh, there's lots of different smart irrigation controllers on the market. But if you're not familiar with what a smart controller is, a smart controller is just your conventional irrigation controller that has the ability to adjust the run times or adjust how much water your, your landscape requires as the conditions change around that system, primarily the weather in most cases. If it's very warm, it increases your run times. If it's cold, if it's um, the winter, the fall, it decreases how much your system puts out. And it does that automatically throughout the year. It's constantly calculating, determining how much water does your system need this week, this month, so forth. And they do this through lots of different means. Uh, some have uh, sensors attached to them that are taking readings of what are the conditions at this site, at this landscape. Um, other ones may be receiving information about the weather from a local uh, weather network. Uh, but they take in some type of in changing factor around that landscape 
and then calculate how much water that landscape needs versus us having that conventional clock to go by at the store that we just say run three days a week, 20 minutes a day. And it does that year round, never really changes it unless you physically go out there and adjust that schedule. So there's lots of different uh, weather-based irrigation controllers on the market. Um, if you're familiar with the EPA Water Sense program, they have a system where they evaluate uh, smart controllers, primarily weather-based controllers at this time, and um, if they pass their 30-day evaluation, they can get that little water sense sticker, just like you see on uh, washing machines, toilets, faucets, those kind of things. They now put that little sticker on irrigation controllers. And there's 21 manufacturers since 2011 who have a water sense sticker on their smart controller. So we see lots of manufacturers here listed. Um, and these are the, the weather-based ones. I'll talk about soil moisture in a little bit. And so 21 different manufacturers out there, um, which is the best? Uh, lots of questions about which one works the best in the landscape. And so we, uh, we addressed this problem uh, starting back in 2008. Um, actually started a little bit before my time at a Dr. Phipps, he had a, pro a project in San Antonio where the city went to their highest water users who um, the high water use was attributed to irrigation, and the city bought smart controllers and installed them at those properties. And then Dr. Phipps and his team came in and did an evaluation a year later, and they found that performance was a mix. Some high water use properties even increased more in their water use. Some decreased. Some of the controller kept breaking. So there was a lot of problems back then, 2006 timeframe with the smart controllers. So when I came on board in 2008, we started a smart controller testing facility at a and to evaluate these uh, products. And so we did this to develop some kind of like a homeowner's uh, consumer guide or an irrigator, irrigation professional's consumer guide on how controllers work in Texas. And so we can see here, here's our little test site we have outside that here's, um, looks like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different controllers here. And these controllers here um, have on-site sensors for measuring weather data. And so you can see a mix of things here. Uh, most of them all have some type of a temperature sensor, some have a solar sensor, some have rain buckets attached to them. Uh, but they all have their own sensor that they're measuring something about the local climate and they're using that as a basis to determine how much water, how many minutes to run the irrigation system. On the flip side of that board, we have uh, three other controllers and uh, these controllers here um, are smart controllers, but they don't have the weather sensor necessarily. Um, these are all signal-based controllers. They either had a cell phone, a pager, internet, where they were getting weather data from some other source, but they have their own rain gauge for localized measurement here. So uh, I believe it was nine controllers total, nine or 10 we've been looking at for a while. And so these are all the manufacturers here. Um, that we've been looking at. I'm not going to go through all the list of their, their brand names, but we can see here that the names of the controller and if they use communications or if they have a sensor tied to them. And then what we did additionally is that that product didn't come with a rain sensor. Um, state rules require a rain sensor on all controllers. We added one to it. So it would be Texas compliant if it was applied in the field. And then what we did was we programmed all those controllers the exact same way. At least that was our goal, that we defined a landscape, what we call the Texas model landscape here. And so six stations here, and you can see with varying plant materials, we have flowers, turf grass, ground cover, small shrubs, large shrubs. And this is all the information you would need to create an irrigation schedule. If someone came to me and said, can you calculate how many minutes per week I should run my irrigation system? This is the information I would need to do the math to calculate for you. This is the scientific method for calculating water requirements. So when we go to these controllers, you would think it'd be pretty simple to translate this description of the landscape into the settings of that controller. Uh, but we found that to be rather difficult. So you can see here, um, X marks, were we able to input that value directly into that controller? Yes or no? And you can see about half the controllers actually asked you for this information. Um, on the other side of that, the other half of the controllers you actually had to calculate your run times. 
you had to calculate your run time and the controller adjusted it versus the other controllers, it calculated the run time from scratch every time it did an irrigation schedule. So programming the controllers was very different across all nine, tech, all nine products here. So I'm not, uh, we've been looking at these for quite a while and um, we have individual year reports on our website. I'll show you that uh, website link a little bit later. What we did a few years ago is we took all the data we had and we combined it into a final summary report. And uh, basically a five-year analysis of smart controller performance in Texas. And so uh, that includes data from 2000 to 2014, um, year-round data. Uh, we ran these controllers. And we evaluate how well those controllers operate. And so here's a, as simple of a chart you can produce on five years of data. You have all of our controllers here, controllers A through I, and then each controller has six zones. Remember the flowers, the turf, grass, the ground cover, the shrubs. And so we looked at here how much water they applied over the years versus what we required. So ideally in a perfect world, every controller would be right here around the one mark. 100% of what we calculated that landscape needed. And so, and then we have this little buffer here, plus or minus 20%. But we can see that some controllers are fairly close to the black line, and some controllers are 200% from what we calculated, twice the water requirements. But you look at these nine products here, and there's really not a whole lot of consistency across these, these different brands. Um, and so we try to figure out, you know, what was our best controller? Um, and it's very difficult to figure out what our best controller is, but we did notice something very interesting looking at this graph. And does anything pop out to y'all looking at this graph? It's interesting. The red one. Yeah, I went back and I changed that color after a while to make it pop out more easy to, to the audience. But the red one, why is that red always so high? And why does most of the controllers always have that, that, that zone six um, as very high watering? And so we go back and we, remember what we had on that description earlier, Zone six was large shrubs. I defined it as having a clay soil and the roots were 20 inches deep. Now in the irrigation world, that's a big gas tank. That can store a lot of water for that plant. So why does the plant that has the most soil water storage available get irrigated the most? Who do I guess? And, uh, and the answer was actually, we, did have to, we started doing a lot of statistics, you know, and all that stuff. And, and the answer was actually right in front of us. So again, looking at this graph, you know, we see why was, why was zone six red for, uh, for these uh, six controllers? And sometimes you have to have what we call in, in, in research a, a, a null hypothesis. Instead of saying why was zone six high, why don't we say, why weren't the other three low? Because we can see here we have A, B, A, D, E, G, H, and I are very excessive, but then why was B, C, and E never above the black mark? I think I heard someone say it there. Um, what makes these controllers different? And it's as simple as looking at the controller itself. Of the 10 controllers on the board, only three have a rain bucket attached to it. Now, every controller has a rain sensor, but only three have a rain bucket. And I'm gonna talk about them, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself a little bit before I get to rain sensors next, but the difference between a rain sensor and a rain bucket, a rain bucket measures the volume of rainfall. A rain sensor says it rained. So, what we see is that those three controllers that actually measure the rainfall had the least chance of over irrigating and uh, so insufficient accounting for rainfall is what we attributed to poor performance in our study that thus far um, so you think about you know what happens here in this part of the state you could have four or five inches of rain in one day or you could have a quarter inch rainfall come through very quickly like I don't know how much rain I got this week probably just a little bit as it came across so how does the controller recognize that? Does it say it rained or does it actually take credit saying, I know it rained 
four inches this week, so I'm not going to turn on, so the controller won't turn on for maybe a week or two because it knows that the soil is wet. It has plenty of moisture in it. Versus those controllers that don't know how much it rained, it just says, don't irrigate today because it rained yesterday. And then maybe the next day it turns back on. So having a controller that can sufficiently account for rainfall is crucial if you're going to utilize smart controller technology. Um, now we do have some new products hitting the market now in the last year, uh, in addition to ones that we're looking at. And what we're seeing is that contr smart controllers are getting smarter. Uh, manufacturers have started discontinuing some of the models that we see on the board, and a lot of manufacturers are going out with what we call the Wi-Fi based controllers. Those that you can install at your home, tie into your local Wi-Fi network, and instead of having to rely on all these sensors, they just incorporate maybe the local National Weather Service weather station closest to you to take credit for what the temperature is, the humidity, the wind, how much rain you receive locally. So there's lots of uh, new advancements happening in that. Um, also the benefit of those Wi-Fi based controllers is that you can turn them on and off from your phone. So if you know, if you're a work and you're like, oh man, so it's getting ready to rain, maybe I can just log into my phone, just turn my controller off and make sure it doesn't run any, any that day. Uh, so what we're getting ready to do is uh, we have a project we're getting ready to start next week or two. Um, is uh, we're going to have a summer evaluation program. I'm just looking at the five most common Wi-Fi based controllers that we are seeing in Texas right now. And so we'll be able to program all five of these the exact same way and then let them operate and then at the end of the summer see which Wi-Fi technology, which Wi-Fi controller system uh, worked the best. So look forward to seeing something like that come out in the future here. But you go to any of your local irrigation stores, um, I even saw that Home Depot now has one or two Wi-Fi based models on the shelf. Um, it could be you know, a lot easier to use a Wi-Fi base you go into the app versus you know turning the controller dial and going through all these settings trying to set your run times versus looking at a computer screen. You can just say zone one, 10 minutes, two days a week. Um, a bit easier management wise. So moving on to sensors here in the last few minutes I have. Um, soil moisture and rain sensors. So we've already talked about does your system have a sensor or not. And I mentioned that in 2009, the TCQ changed some rules for landscape irrigation that every new system had to have a sensor, either a rain or soil moisture shop device attached to the irrigation system. So that means a rain sensor or a soil moisture sensor had to be attached to all of your systems. And that's fairly simple to do because all controllers um, in the marketplace have sensor inputs. So you can see here's a picture of you open up a controller box and uh, there's a little label there with a sensor input. Go to another controller model, open the door up. It may be a little bit more faint to read, but it has SEN, and it has two ports there for you to attach a sensor. So all controllers should have the capability to attach a sensor to it. So we look at rain sensors, and I've already kind of hit on this two times now, but to refresh and elaborate a bit more, all that conventional rain sensor does is detect the presence of rainfall. And the goal of that is to turn off the irrigation if it's irrigated during the rainfall event or to not allow the irrigation to turn on immediately following a rainfall event. That's the primary purpose a conventional rain sensor uh, serves. Now, you can adjust your thresholds on these sensors. You know, they have settings on there. How sensitive do you want it to turn off at? Do you want, you know, as much as an eighth of an inch to turn off your controller or as much as a one inch in some cases uh, before it turns off your controller. Um, so this depends on which sensor you have um, as to how sensitive you can set it to trigger or not trigger. So typical kind of types of rain sensors there you see. Uh, but when we say we do have those smart controllers that have the rain buckets or the tipping buckets we saw, we call them tipping bucket rain gauges because in most cases, here's a schematic of the, on the right of the center picture it has a little bucket in there and it measures as it fills up, it tips over and it dumps that rain. It can count how many times it tipped over and each tip is equal to a certain amount of rainfall. And so that's how this basic technology works. And they come in all these square round gauges uh, where they measure that rainfall. So kind of hit this too already, our keys to efficient, efficient rain sensor use is um, make sure it's in a good open area. You don't want it to be shaded, don't want it to be blocked by trees. Um, anything that can you know, just be open to where when it rains, 
their sensor comes in straight in contact with that rainfall. Uh, additionally, um, verify your sensor switches are on on the controller. For some reason these days, lots of manufacturers now have a setting on their controller for you to activate or bypass your sensor. So you can have your sensor installed correctly on your controller, but if it's in bypass mode, it's not going to do anything. And so this may be actually on the face of the controller or it may be a little switch inside the door of the controller. Just something for you to check out and make sure that it is in the active position. And then finally, closing up here, talking about soil moisture sensors. Um, use of soil moisture sensors are as a good alternative to your typical ET, evapotranspiration, or weather-based irrigation monitoring systems. Um, and a soil moisture sensor attaches to the same place as most races would. Um, connect right to that port. And when we look at soil moisture sensors, there's basically two types of technology in the marketplace. I'm going to get into a scientific lecture on the two types of technologies here, but we see we have what we call water potential sensors and volumetric content sensors here. They're all very good technologies. The only difference is, is that cheaper technology, expensive technology, analog versus digital. Uh, but we use uh, the water sensors all the time. It's just a big cost difference from an analog to a digital sensor. Um, but they've all worked about the same way as far as effectiveness in the field. So it is an add-on device to your controller. And if you want to know the scientific means behind this is that it's a soil moisture sensor is just a common interrupt device. And I'm not going to get into the technical terms of that, but it's just like the thermostat in your home. When does your thermostat, when does your AC turn on your house? When it gets too warm, right? Well, what this does is it says, okay, when your soil gets too dry, the irrigation can turn on. If your soil is wet, the irrigation cannot turn on. That's a simple concept, and it's monitoring the real conditions in the soil at that time. Now, with the use of that sensor, you still have to go into your controller and calculate, okay, so when it does turn on, how many minutes should it turn on? How, how, how many minutes it take to fill up your roof zone so that it's wet and not dry? So, Keys to efficient use of soil moisture sensors is to make sure you install that sensor within the effective root zone of your landscape. If the sensor is not in the root zone, you're not going to be managing that system correctly. Uh, challenges to that are if you have very shallow roots, um, a lot of sensors have problems with that. So you really can't use a sensor for something with less than a three inch root zone. Um, too much air in the soil at that point. You gotta have, you know, it'll be below three inches to have a good soil to sensor contact where you're gonna get some good readings. Um, you want to put in a representative location of your landscape. Um, some place doesn't hold water, but a high spot. Um, different soil types could attribute to that. Um, changes in root zone depth. So, um, let me see where I'm at here. Okay. So we've been testing the sensors for about a year and a half now in our lab on campus. We're doing this for the EPA Water Sense program so they can have some guidelines to get that label to these products. And uh, we've been learning a lot about these sensors. And I'm not going to go into a lot of the technical stuff, but I have a, a graph here of some raw data from the sensor. And so this is what we record and read from the sensors. And in this case, uh, I'll just give a brief explanation. A value of zero means wet and a value of 100 means dry. So we're tracking how dry the soil gets, and then that purple line is when it turns on the irrigation. So that's a very busy graph. So you, nobody understands that graph, but me and Dr. Phipps pretty much, but um, I cleaned it up for you, and this is the cleaned process data. And all you need to know here is black is what we calculate, and the colored line is the sensor. And you can see from day one of installation, how the differences change. So from the very first irrigation to, in this case, the fifth cycles, uh, of five cycles of irrigation, what we see is that the accuracy of these sensors increases over time. And what I want to point out is that a soil moisture is not something you're gonna see the results of right away. Because what happens is you dig a hole, you change that soil, and then you put it back. So you've got to get that soil wet, recompact it over time. So you may take about a season or two to get the full benefits of that sensor being recognized in the field because you can see here, by our fourth or fifth cycle, 
Our lines are almost on top of each other. We've reestablished that, that soil packing in the ground because we've disrupted it before. So you can expect that over time to see that performance increase the longer that sensor's in the ground and that soil rebuilds around that sensor device. So uh, testing programs, like I said, all of our information on our web, on our technology website, the ITC website, uh, itc.tamu.edu. You can go there and see reports on smart controllers. Um, soon to be some information about our soil moisture sensor testing programs. And then other things like our Water My Yard program, Texas ET Network that were mentioned earlier. Okay? I think it's time. Oh, well, let, let's. Do you want to go to lunch? One, 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 one question. Does your website have any information on the controllers as they're rated once it's tested? We don't rate them, no, sir. Okay. We just pro we provide you the information to draw your own conclusions. I, I, go ahead. Uh, well, to a sense that all of the uh, red based ones, uh, how local are them? I mean, the situation in Texas is it can rain. No, that's a it's a very good question, and that's something that we're hoping to evaluate and uh, see how localized some of these companies are pulling their data. Um, some in review just basically have National Weather Service, which is essentially airport weather stations. So how far are you from the closest airport? Um, some cities have local rain gauge networks, or um, you know, so you may have something more closer to you as a part of a city network that's posted online. Um, but that's definitely a concern that we have with these Wi-Fi technology that are pulling weather data from somewhere and using that to manage irrigation. How effective is that uh, based on the different manufacturers' approaches? I, I waited uh, from Sunday all the way to Thursday night for that Thursday rain. Yeah. I knew it was coming and I was concerned about whether we should suggest, but it didn't happen. So I think, I, I, I understand that. I wanted to say, Charles, that uh, to me, with the the most exciting thing about conservation lately has been the actual interaction with cell phones and stuff, where you can do these things. Same way with smart meters. We're not going to talk about those today, but we now have the technology where meters can be read instantly and constantly. They can talk to you on your cell phone and tell you you've reached some number to indicate a leak in your system. You can do the same. I've always been convinced that none of us waste water because we want to or think it's a good idea. And the more aware we become of these things like this and our, our usage, the more aware we become, the more we conserve. Any more questions? Charles drove all the way, I assume, from a grand to I did. And uh, we want to thank you. Charles, what are you using in your yard? Um, she doesn't have one. I don't water my yard. See? <laughs> no, I, I just, I use the ET network. I just judge it as I need to. I don't let anything on So it's manual. You don't have a Wi-Fi. You just go out there and change it. You don't use the programmable stuff. You just go ahead and. Uh, I do it all manually because I, I know more about my landscape than the manufacturer yeah. does. And my uh, fashion way. Yeah. At Lone Star, we have a, about a 20, well, 20,000 gallons of rainwater collection that we use. For irrigation, drip irrigation, but that's that mine's been off. I I'm in charge of operating that, and when it needs it, I turn it on, and when it doesn't, I turn it off. And uh, we managed to go almost all last year without turning that on, except to use rainwater. And my goal is never to use Conroe water, and we managed to do that for a whole year by just paying attention to what your yard needs versus what you think. Thank you very much. We're going to uh, so discuss. So, have you enjoyed the morning? Yes.